The Peter Schiff Show. Well, yesterday we got the release of the October monthly trade deficit. And we got a trade deficit of $48.7 billion. That was a little bit north of the $47.4 billion that had been the consensus forecast. And in fact, the prior month, which was $43.5 billion, was revised upwards to $44.9 billion. The larger number did cause the Atlanta Fed to shave down its estimates for fourth quarter GDP, I think from 3 and a half to 3.2. Uh, my guess is uh, they're going to be revising it lower. Most of the numbers I've been seeing uh, show that uh, the economy is certainly slowing down, at least the way you would measure it, uh, using the GDP from where it was in the third quarter. But, you know, what's significant about this trade deficit, it is ties the largest trade deficit in five years. And it is the biggest monthly trade deficit since Trump has been sworn in as president. Now, if you remember, when Donald Trump ran for office, the trade deficit was a big part of his campaign. He wanted to lower it. He said the trade deficit was too big, and the fact that it was so big and that it had you know, been allowed to get so big, all these countries were taking advantage of us, and he was going to fix it. He was going to make America great again, in part by you know, getting rid of these trade deficits. right? So we were going to start operating at a profit again. He's not talking about trade deficit anymore. I mean, does he want to accept responsibility for the increasing trade deficit, just like he's claiming credit for the rising stock market? You know, when Trump was a candidate, he never talked about, you know, vote for me and I'll make the stock market go up. I mean, he said the stock market was a bubble. Part of the problem was that the stock market, you know, was the only thing going up, that the economy was actually getting worse, despite the fact that we had a stock market bubble. So, a higher stock market was not part of his stump speech, yet that's all he talks about now is how high the stock market was. What was part of his stump speech was shrinking the trade deficit. Well, trade deficit's not shrinking. It's growing. And in fact, I believe that the trade deficit is going to end up hitting an all-time record high during the Trump presidency. So it's going to be a complete failure he campaigned on a lower deficit. We're going to get a much bigger deficit. And of course, the trade deficit is growing even as the dollar is down. The dollar has fallen by, I think, about 8 or 9% this year. Now, most economists always tell you, well, if the dollar goes down, that's going to be good for trade, right? It's going to be good for our exports. It's going to be make imports more expensive. So we'll import less. We'll export more. None of that happens. See, what actually happens when the dollar goes down, it simply makes our imports more expensive. And so our trade deficit goes up. It's not like we can just buy uh, domestically produced goods instead of foreign produced goods because we don't produce the goods. We have to import them. We just have to pay more to do it. And the trade deficit gets goes higher. And since I believe the dollar is headed a lot lower uh, during the Trump presidency, that means the trade deficit is heading a lot higher. That's exactly what happened under Bush. The dollar hit an all-time record low under George W. Bush, and the trade deficit hit an all-time record high. And since I think the dollar is going to take out the lows that it established under Bush, I think the trade deficit is going to take out the highs. Now, at some point, of course, the dollar will lose so much value that Americans will, will stop importing. They'll be too broke. So consumption is going to go over the edge of a cliff. And at that point, the trade deficit is really going to come down along with the economy because once Americans can no longer afford uh, to consume, right, you have a whole GDP that's based on consumption, the whole thing is going to fall apart. But it is ironic that this is an issue that was a critical part of the Trump campaign and nobody's really talking about the fact that the trade deficit is going in the wrong direction. You know, another very interesting story, and I missed this when it came out a few weeks ago, but that has to do with the maturity of the national debt. One of the things that Trump talked about a lot when he was a candidate was the fact that we needed to take advantage of the low long-term interest rates by locking these rates in, right? By refinancing the national debt and selling more 30-year government bonds rather than short-term government bills, right? Lock in these low interest rates, take advantage of it. In fact, he was critical of the Obama administration for not having done this on behalf of the American people, not locking in 
these rates. Now, I remember when he was saying that, I was telling people it's not going to happen. In fact, I remember listening to a speech Steve Moore gave at the Money Show, and he specifically talked about how Trump was going to do this, how he was going to, you know, lock in these low rates. And and I and I said to Stephen after the speech, I said he's never going to do that. It's impossible because if he actually tried to do it, the rates wouldn't be low anymore because interest rates would really move up, and that would you know undermine the whole bubble economy. Uh, and so I said it was never going to happen. And now I read this article where the Treasury Department under Trump has actually announced a plan to do the opposite of what Trump campaigned on. There's one thing you could say about Donald Trump. He's consistent, right? And so what the policy is, is to shorten the maturity of the national debt for the government in the future to be selling more six month, one year, you know, short term notes and not to be financing, not to be borrowing at the long end. So in other words, he is going to criticize what he He's going to do what he criticized Obama for doing and not do what he promised. And by doing this, of course, by shortening the maturity of the national debt, you simply leave the taxpayer on the hook for an even bigger interest expense when interest rates go up. And this, of course, is particularly problematic when you are about to enact tax cuts that are going to make the existing deficits even bigger. And therefore, we're going to have to borrow even more money and we're going to have to take even more interest rate risk because eventually interest rates are going to go way up. When that's going to happen, that's the $64 trillion question. But I do know that it will happen. And Donald Trump as a candidate recognized the risk and said, hey, we're going to lock in these rates. But as the president, he knows that he can't do that because the process of trying to lock in those rates would actually cause interest rates to rise now. And that would be a big problem for the economy, for the stock market, for the real estate market, for the government itself. And so quietly, the president is doing the opposite. You know, another reason, too, that they really want to keep a lid on interest rates is part of the tax tax bills, uh, they make it so companies have a limit to the amount of interest expense they can deduct. Of course, certain companies, real estate companies, I think at the last minute they stuck in a, an exemption for car dealerships. But most companies, they'll only be able to write off a certain expense, a certain portion of their, of their interest expense. And so to the extent that interest rates really go up, that is going to uh, you know, hurt corporations and that now they're going to have a larger expense that they can to- no longer deduct uh, from their U.S. Tox- taxes. You know, speaking about the whole idea of these corporate tax cuts, you know, the, the Republican talking point behind these tax cuts is that uh, the average American family, as a result of these corporate tax cuts, is going to have a $4,000 raise. Now, I don't know where this $4,000 figure came from or how they concocted it, but to me, it's complete nonsense. I mean, I don't even think the tax cuts themselves are large enough to the point that if 100% of the tax cuts were paid to the workers, that there's even enough of a tax cut there to give every household a $4,000 raise based on these tax cuts. But of course, the stock market is rallying specifically because investors believe that the tax cuts are not going to go to higher salaries for their workers. Because if the companies were simply going to take the tax cuts and expense them as salary instead, then corporate earnings wouldn't be going up, right? They would just be paying higher wages uh, and their money would be spent on wages instead of taxes. The stock market is going up because investors believe that the tax cuts are going to be used for higher dividends or they're going to be used to buy back stock. And so if they're going to use the tax cuts to pay dividends and buy back stock, how are they going to use them uh, to pay higher wages? In fact, we got some wage data today. We got numbers out on uh, productivity and costs And this was for the third quarter. And non-farm productivity rose by 3%, slightly below the 3.2% rise that was expected. But the reason was a drop in unit labor costs. They were actually looking for unit labor costs to rise by 0.3 in the quarter. They fell by 0.2. So wages are going down. I mean, this is what's going on. This is why Trump is president, because so many people had their wages going down. You know, by the way, we got the ADP jobs numbers today. This is the the precursor to the the big number that comes out on Friday. And obviously, I'll talk about that when we get it. But we got the 190,000 jobs, um, according to ADP. These are private sector jobs. And a lot of these jobs, we had a big number 
in manufacturing, which is weird. We don't normally have a big increase uh, in, in manufacturing jobs. This was I forget what the number was, 40,000 or some, some odd. It was, a, it was a big number. The only, the decline, we had a decline in the construction. But, you know, if we really have more manufacturing jobs, A, why are wages going down? And B, why is the trade deficit going up? I mean, if we're hiring more workers to manufacture stuff, why aren't we exporting that stuff, right? So if, if we're really, you know, growing manufacturing jobs, wouldn't you see the result of that in the trade numbers? Because manufactured stuff can be exported, right? Those are real goods that, are, that supposedly are being manufactured and either we can export them or if we're manufacturing stuff ourselves, well, wouldn't that mean we have to import less stuff from abroad if we're making this stuff ourselves? So a lot of those numbers don't even jive. Uh, but to me, I'm seeing stagnating wages and um, an economy that is really just hyped up on a bunch of optimism that's based on a lot of expectations of growth that's going to come from these tax cuts that's not going to be there. You have all kinds of high hopes, uh, which are eventually uh, going to be dashed. You know, by the way, Al Franken in the news again today, now you've got almost a dozen Democratic senators calling for Al Franken to step down. Resignation. The latest, we have another woman who has come out and accused Al Franken of forcibly attempting to kiss her. He didn't actually kiss her. He attempted to kiss her. And according to the way it's described, he attempted to forcibly kiss her. Now, I read her account of it, and apparently, you know, he tried to kiss her and she, you know, she moved her head so he didn't actually kiss her, and then she left. Now, to me, is that a forcible attempt to kiss her, or did he just attempt to kiss her? I mean, because force would imply he grabbed her, like he held her down or something. I mean, if you try to kiss somebody, that doesn't mean that you're forcibly kissing. I think they're trying to make it sound worse. Maybe it was an uninvited kiss. Maybe she didn't give him permission to kiss her. And in fact, he didn't kiss her. He tried to kiss her. He leaned in for a kiss. She turned away. And so he didn't kiss her. I mean, if he was forcibly trying to kiss her, I bet he would have kissed her. He's probably bigger than this woman. And so if he wanted to kiss her by force, he probably would have kissed her. The fact that he attempted to kiss her, but failed to me means he didn't try to do it forcibly. He just tried to kiss her. And, um, and she obviously didn't want to be kissed. Now, I have no idea what might have gone on between the two of them, I mean, that may have led Al Franken to believe that she might have wanted to be kissed and maybe that was the right thing to do. I have no idea, you know. But, you know, one of the things that this woman has has alleged, and I don't believe this, actually, I think this woman is making this up, is that she said that when Al Franken tried to kiss her, he said, it's my right as an entertainer. Like, I'm just claiming my rights to kiss you because I'm an entertainer. And, and to me, it, it, I, don't think Al, I don't think he would say that. Now, he's denied saying it. But the problem is, I don't think he has a lot of credibility because I don't believe that he is telling the truth when he says he accidentally you know, touched the, the, the butts of the women that he was photographed with. I don't, I, I don't believe that for a minute. I think, he, I think he grabbed their butts on purpose. But he doesn't want to admit that. Uh, so he's saying that he did it by accident. So, but I think a lot of other people can see that, that doesn't really make much sense. So I think now, you know, once you cry wolf, it's difficult. Now he's saying, well, I never said that. It doesn't seem to me that that would be his pickup line, that, that you know, that he would be saying, it's my right to kiss you as an entertainer. It seems too convenient to me um, because think about the, the Billy Bush, Access Hollywood, Donald Trump locker room talk where he told Billy Bush Hey, I, you know, I'm rich, I'm famous, and so I could just grab them by the you know what, right? To me, it seems like it's too similar to that. Like they're trying to lay this foundation to compare what Franken did to what uh, a Trump has been accused of doing. And remember, all he did was attempt to kiss somebody. He didn't even actually kiss her. And now they're saying, oh, you got to resign because you tried to kiss somebody. You failed, but you tried. And this wasn't his employee. He was doing a radio show, and apparently there was a guest there, and I think she was the secretary of the guest. So somebody came in to the studio to do a show, and and, and apparently before she left, he tried to plant one on her, and she didn't want to be kissed, and, and that was it. But he doesn't have any power over her. He's not her superior. She doesn't work for him. 
Uh, and but all of a sudden, hey, you got to resign. You tried to kiss this woman, and you know she didn't give you permission, and so you know you got to resign. But I think what they're trying to do is lay a foundation, and we'll see if I'm right. Because I think the Democrats are setting a trap because, A, they're going to sacrifice one of their own, right? Let's take out Al Franken. Let's make him the sacrificial lamb, right? Because we have all these women who are accusing him of this inappropriate behavior. So let's say, hey, hey, Al, you got to step down. This is terrible, right? We're going to do the right thing. We're going to have you step down. And as soon as this happens, and apparently he has a press conference tomorrow. I have no idea if he's going to step down. But what I think they're doing is at some point, There's going to be some more women that are going to come out and they're going to say similar things about Donald Trump. Oh, he tried to kiss me. Uh, He put his hand on me, you know, before he was president. And maybe some of this stuff is going to be true. I mean, you know, maybe even between marriages. I mean, Trump's been married three times. And so that means he spent some time being divorced. And he's a rich single guy in New York City. I'm sure he's around a lot of women. I'm sure he kissed a number of them. Uh, maybe he put his hands on a number of them. Who knows what the environment was, uh, you know, where Trump's around a lot of attractive young women and a lot of those women are probably attracted to Trump uh, because of who he is. Obviously, that's 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 going to be there. But I'm sure there's going to be some women that are going to come out, more women that have already come out. They're going to make these kind of accusations and the Democrats are going to say, OK, Republicans, we when it was a Democrat, when it was Al Franken, you know, we asked him to resign. So why don't you Republicans do the same thing with President Trump? If Al Franken resigned because of these accusations, well, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. So Trump should resign too. I think I think this is a big setup. We'll see if I'm right. That's just my gut feeling. As soon as I read this stuff and I hear uh, this that where this woman is saying, Al Franken said it's his right as an entertainer to kiss whoever he wants. I'm thinking, wait a minute, that's like Donald Trump saying, hey, it's my right to grab a woman by the by the you know what. Because, you know, I'm rich and famous. It, to me, it, it, it's too similar to just be a random coincidence in the way this thing is coming out. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But again, I don't think this is sexual harassment. If a guy tries to kiss a woman and doesn't because she turns her head, what is the big deal? Now, I mean, you know, was, was this the right thing for Al Franken to do? Nobody knows. We weren't in the room. Right? So we don't know what happened, what kind of body language, what kind of chemistry. I mean, she's claiming she did nothing. And he just, out of left field, ran up to her and tried to kiss her, claiming his right as an entertainer to kiss any woman uh, that he wants. I mean, if, if he was doing that, then why does, you know, didn't he claim that right with every single woman that went into his radio studio? I mean, what was so special about this woman that he, this is the only time he's trying to declare his rights as an entertainer? So my guess is that, you know, Maybe something happened between the two of them where maybe he thought that, you know, kissing her was the, the right move. Maybe, um, maybe you know, and but it wasn't, obviously. But now all of a sudden it comes out and, th- you know, how many years later? This is two years, four years before he was even a, a U.S. senator. Right? No, no, too, this is too convenient. This is very, very suspicious. And we'll see, as I said, you know, we'll watch the news. We'll see what happens uh, if they try to pull this on, on Donald Trump. Of course, I can't uh, wind up this podcast without talking about Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is at a new all-time high today. In fact, as I am recording this uh, uh, podcast, Bitcoin is up $1,500 on the day. On the day. This is the biggest uh, dollar move I've ever seen in the cryptocurrency. Now, of course, percentage-wise, it's about 13.5%. I know I've seen moves this big before. But because the currency is now so expensive, in order to have a 13% move, it's you know be a bigger dollar number. In fact, this is the first time that Bitcoin has traded above 12,000, and it's also trading above 13,000 on the same day. So far, the high, and it's right on the high right now. As I am recording, it is at 13,250. At least that's what it is on Bitstamp, which is the website that I'm looking at it. So it could be higher on some other exchange. But 13,250 you know, up uh, 13.5%. Who knows, you know, where it's going to be by the time anybody listens to this podcast. But clearly, um, the bubble is getting bigger and bigger. Now, there are a lot of people who are trying to read into this that, oh, this is the end of the, the fiat currencies, right? That the movement up in cryptocurrencies is a sign that people are losing confidence in the fiat monetary system, right? That people are losing confidence in the dollar or the euro, right? 
I don't think people are losing confidence at all. I mean, they should, but they're not. I mean, if people were losing confidence in the dollar and other currencies, right, and that was why they were buying Bitcoin, it would not just be Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies that were going up. Everything would be going up. All commodities would be going up. Maybe they wouldn't be going up as much as Bitcoin, but they would be going up a lot. And it wouldn't just be commodities across the board that would be going up. You would see bonds getting killed. Bond prices would be tumbling because bonds are simply IOUs of you know, fiat currency. And if people were losing confidence in fiat currency, then they wouldn't want to own bonds. So bond prices would be under pressure. Yields would be rising. Inflation premiums would be rising because if people were thinking that there was going to be a collapse of the fiat monetary system, then obviously people would be expecting big increases in inflation and those increases would be priced into the bond market. So bond prices would be tanking, commodity prices would be rising, probably stock markets would be falling too. People would be really worried. None of this is happening. And that's because what's going on in the cryptocurrency space has nothing to do with a loss of confidence of the dollar or any other currency. I mean, some of the people that bought cryptocurrencies four or five years ago, some of the libertarian anarcho-capitalist guys, yeah, they didn't have any confidence in, in, in the dollar. And so, you know, they, they bought cryptocurrencies. But the people buying it today, it's got nothing to do with whether or not they, they have lost confidence in the dollar. In fact, the reason they're buying cryptocurrencies is to get more dollars. They're buying cryptocurrencies because they're going up. They're hoping to increase the number of dollars they own by taking some dollars, buying some Bitcoin, having the price of Bitcoin go up, and then sell the Bitcoin and get more dollars, right? That is what is going on. And I think this is going on across the board. You know, I was speaking to uh, a guy that works with me at my asset management company, and he had just, you know, flown into California. And the cab driver that picked him up um, at the airport and drove him home, spent the entire time talking to him about cryptocurrencies. And he, he, he showed him his wallet and the currencies he owned. This is a taxi cab driver, right? And so this is, you know, your classic, you know, when the taxi cab driver is giving you stock tips, this time it's not stock tips, it's cryptocurrency tips. He's telling you which cryptocurrency to buy. You know, back in the real estate bubble days, you know, the cab drivers were, were buying uh, spec homes, right? And in the 1990s, they were buying dot-coms in their E-Trade account. And now they're buying, uh, you know, Bitcoin in their Coinbase account. By the way, you know, the IRS is now really cracking down. They're looking for uh, people who bought cryptocurrencies who haven't paid any taxes. Uh, because apparently very few people have actually claimed any income off of cryptocurrencies, even though the price has, you know, gone up dramatically. And so all this regulatory scrutiny is ultimately going to be one of the many things that, that undermines uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies this is going to be the regulators crapping down. But ultimately, even if the regulators aren't cracking down, I think the bubble is going to just collapse all on its own, whether it finds a pin or the air just comes out. Uh, but, you know, Alan Greenspan was on uh, CNBC today. And of course, they asked him about Bitcoin because they asked everybody about Bitcoin. In fact, all they talked about today was Bitcoin. Every time I turned it on, that was the topic of conversation. Uh, and it reminded me very much of the way they talked about, you know, KTEL or, you know, whatever these, you know, stocks were, uh, the globe.com back in the, in the 1990s, right? They were all over these internet stocks. So they're talking a lot about cryptocurrency, but they had Alan Greenspan on there. And of course, Greenspan says that, um, you know, they're, 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 it's just a bubble, right? They're, they're worthless. They're going to collapse. He says, I, you know, ironically, he's like, well, how could you take something that has no value and just claim it as value? Which, of course, that's what the central banks do all the time. So that's kind of ironic, right? But, but, but that's true, right? Money needs to have real value. I mean, gold as money, gold had value before it became money, right? People are just saying, oh, Bitcoin has value. And again, I read more and more articles again today where the people who are buying Bitcoin are buying it because it's digital gold. I mean, everybody is now conceded it's never going to be money, that it's not a digital currency. It's a digital asset. It's digital gold, right? It's a digital safe haven. So the people who are buying it now aren't even buying it because they, they think there's a problem in the, the global monetary system. They're buying it because they're convinced 
that it's digital gold. And a lot of people buying it have never actually bought real gold. I mean, people who never were worried enough about the, the dollar or inflation, they were never worried enough to buy real gold. Now, all of a sudden, they got to buy digital gold. Why? The reason is they want to get rich. Digital gold is going straight up. Right? Real gold isn't doing anything. Believe me, if the price of gold was really skyrocketing, and eventually it will be, then these cab drivers are going to start to buy gold. They want to buy Bitcoin now, not because it's digital gold. That's like what, you know, maybe the, 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 how they're explaining it. They want to buy it because it's going up. They want to get in on it, right? They, they want to get rich like the other people are getting rich who own it. But anyway, when Greenspan was talking about it, he compared it, and I've, I've seen this comparison before. I, I forget if it was Greenspan that made it or somebody else, but he compared it to the Continental, which was money around the time of the Revolutionary War issued by uh, the Continental Congress, and it was called the Continental. And of course, ultimately, the Continental collapsed, and there was a lot of loss. And that is one of the reasons that we're on the gold standard, because when they wrote the Constitution, the reason that they didn't give the federal government the power to print money right, was because they didn't want another continental. A famous expression or a phrase uh, back then in, you know, the late 18th century was not worth a continental, right? And, and so the founding fathers, having experienced the losses associated with paper money, they wanted to make sure that future Americans did not suffer a similar fate. So they did not allow the federal government to issue paper money. They took that power away from the federal government by not granting them that power. The only power they were granted was to coin money. Now, what was money? Well, they defined money as gold and silver. In Article 1, Section 10, they said no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin, legal tender and payment of debt. And the only thing that the federal government was able to do with money was coin it. They were not able to admit bills of credit. That was money. In fact, the first draft of the Constitution gave them that power, and they struck it by a vote of 9 to 2. So you can actually see this in the Elliott debates. You can read about the fact that they initially wanted to allow the Congress to issue paper money, and they took the power away because they didn't trust them. But of course, the paper money still would have been backed by gold. But even then, they didn't trust it because the Continental was backed, but it collapsed. But ultimately, the people who own Continentals recovered 10 cents on the dollar. So it wasn't a total loss, right? You lost 90% of, of, of your, your, your money. You got 10 cents on the dollar. It was actually redeemed in gold on the Continental. So that's why I think the comparison between Bitcoin and the Continental is not a fair one because ultimately, no matter how high Bitcoin goes before the bubble pops, I think the people who are going to end up losing, right, the people who come in late to the party, right, I think their losses are going to be much greater than 90%. So I think it's going to be worse than the Continental. And, and so I think the expression not worth the Bitcoin is going to replace the expression not worth the Continental. I think it may be uh, part of the American lexicon. I think, you know, in not too many years, I don't know how many, we'll see, but not worth a Bitcoin could be a common phrase uh, that people use to describe something that has absolutely no value. Mm -hmm.